Hello there. I'm Professor Laura Haldane, and this is English 3020, American Literature from 1900 to Present. In this course, we'll study the wide variety of authors, topics, genres, and themes that are characteristic of the 20th century of American literature. In week one, we'll be starting with poetry of William Carlos Williams, Wallace Stevens, Robert Frost, and one poem from Marianne Moore. So join me as together we study the nature of American literature. Our poets for this week all belong to the modernist movement. So I want to give you a brief introduction to some of the ideas of modernism, which we'll explore in more detail later in the semester when we return to some other modernist poets. The modernist period came about after World War I and in many ways was a response to World War I. During the World War, there was a catastrophic loss of life, which led many people to question the traditional beliefs and expectations of society before the war. There was a questioning of the old ways of doing things in all aspects of life, but also in art. So during this time, we really see artists turn away from the traditional forms and structures of their field to recreate what art meant, as well as what art should do. As a result, we see a lot of experimentation and innovation in technique and style, and especially in poetry, a lot of changes in structure, rhythm, and what a poem should actually look like and talk about. So in modernist literature, at least, and in poetry, we often see a focus on the individual and the everyday, as well as the individual's response to society, as well as how the individual interprets and makes sense of reality with a focus on the uncertain nature of reality and our ability to accurately comprehend it. At the same time, we also see a focus on images, as imagism was a part of the modernist art movement, which is something we definitely see in the poems for this week. Robert Frost was born in 1874 and died in 1963. He was born in California, but he's considered a New England poet as he spent most of his life in that region. He moved his family to England for a time, which is where he really found fame and success as a poet, but after that he returned to New Hampshire to start a farm, where he spent the rest of his life. He really rejected some of the ideas of modernism because he really used and believed in the power of traditional forms, so we don't see him move away from that traditional structure in the same way other modernist poets do. Instead of having poems be vague and challenging, he really sought to present these more clear-cut images. So his subject matter and his themes are often difficult, but the images he uses to present those themes are often very accessible and things many readers, especially American readers, would be familiar with. He's also often considered a regionalist as he focused on American settings, specifically New England locales, and kind of celebrated those areas as the heart of America. Wallace Stevens, who was born in 1879 and died in 1955, is another New England poet. He went to Harvard for a few years before dropping out to become a journalist. He later returned to law school and became a really successful lawyer who eventually became a vice president of his firm. So he was by no means a starving artist as he had, you know, his job as a poet, but also his job as a successful lawyer. So he was very wealthy. Stevens was friends with William Carlos Williams and Marianne Moore, some other poets we read this week. And Stevens' poetry really does show a lot of those modernist ideas, like the lack of faith in religion, as many people after the war were questioning religious belief, were questioning religious tradition and doctrine, and finding that not satisfactory to explain the terrible chaos and destruction of the World War. And so Stevens himself did turn away from religion, and we see a lot of questioning of religion in his poetry. And we also, of course, his poetry shows experimentation with form and structure, as it looks very different from what we usually expect poetry to look like, and he does focus a lot on images in his poems. So Stevens also spends a lot of time on developing the subjectivity of his speakers. So we often see in his poems a speaker observing the world and kind of creating reality from those observations. William Carlos Williams then was born in 1883 and died in 1963. He was another poet from the East Coast as he was born in New Jersey. And Williams, like Stevens, was also fairly well off. He trained as a doctor so he could make enough money to afford to be a poet. Despite the fact that he saw himself as a poet first and a doctor second, 
He was considered a very good doctor who specialized in pediatrics and delivered more than 2,000 babies in his career. Williams was friends with poets Ezra Pound and H.D. Hilda Doolittle, who we will be reading later in the semester, as well as Wall Stevens and Marianne Moore. Williams also rejected the pessimism and negative writing of modernist poets like Eliot, though he also took issue with Frost's overly rosy interpretation of America. He really thought that Frost did too much nostalgic reminiscence of America's rural past, rather than talking about and dealing with both the positives and negatives of contemporary American society. Williams was experimental in his poetry, but he did not like free verse, a main component of a lot of modernist poetry. He strongly believed in rhythm and linking one line to another. So if we take these three authors together, we see they do have some um, exercise of these modernist ideas, but they also kind of rejected some of the other key components of modernism, which really goes to show you that any literary field and period has a lot of variation within it. The first and most important thing I want you to remember for this week's reading is that poetry can be very challenging. I have two degrees in English, and I still often struggle to find meaning or even understand what's going on in some poems, especially from the authors that we're reading this week. The resources on Blackboard, like the How to Read a Poem article and the Poetry Devices video, will both kind of give you some concepts and approaches in how to actually deal with reading a poem. And my goal for you this week as you're reading these poems is for you to find at least one line, one moment, a stanza, an idea, an image, or really anything in the poem that speaks to you or that you can understand. You can then build on that one moment that you understand in order to kind of make sense of the poem as a whole. In the next segment of this video, we're going to read through one of our poems for this week, Robert Frost's After Apple Picking. And there's two things I want you to kind of keep in mind as we read through that. First of all, an important distinction in poetry is to distinguish between the speaker and the author. So Robert Frost obviously is the author of this poem, but the speaker that he uses in the poem may or may not be similar to the author himself. For example, if I really wanted to, I could write a poem from the viewpoint of, you know, an animal, like a dog. Obviously, I am not a dog, so the speaker and the author are not going to be the same. We may share some characteristics, some personality traits, or we may be entirely different. It's important to kind of realize what the poet is saying and how it's different from what the speaker might be saying, and vice versa. Also, when we read a poem, and this will become apparent when we actually start looking at after apple picking, if there's no punctuation at the end of a line, like a comma or a period or a dash or a semicolon, you don't stop reading at the end of the line. You'll continue reading until you come to either the end of the sentence or the end of the phrase, or another piece of punctuation that signals you to stop or to pause. After Apple Picking by Robert Frost My long, two-pointed ladder is sticking through a tree toward heaven still, and there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it, and there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough, but I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night, the scent of apples. I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend. And I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were ten thousand thousand fruit to touch, Cherish in hand, lift down, and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, 
The woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. So when we think about how we first want to approach this poem, one technique that I often use is kind of going through chronologically and trying to sort of decide what's happening in each section. Or kind of getting a sense maybe of the overall feeling in each section, the tone in each section, the mood, the atmosphere, um, you know, kind of what sort of feeling is being created by the author in that section. And it can be good to kind of go through chronologically because often a poem has a structure that sort of changes as we move through the poem from beginning to end. So in this first sort of image here, we get the idea of a ladder sticking through a tree and pointing upward. We see there's a barrel um, that is not entirely full next to this ladder, and there are some apples that are still on the tree. So right away in that first image, we kind of get a sense of work unfinished, but also kind of the sense of a lot of work being done, um, because it was so exhausting that they didn't actually end up finishing their work in the end. The speaker, that is. And again, we also get that sense of exhaustion because he's left the ladder and the bucket out there as if he was too tired to actually put them away in their proper place where they belong. All right, and then we kind of have in line here, in line number six, essence of winter sleep is on the night. So here, we kind of get a shift from that first image to a different kind of image. Um, you know, we get that we're back kind of with that speaker, there's a scent of apples in the room, and we hear very clearly that he's drowsing off. So we know that something is they're exhausted, they're tired. And then we sort of move to this new image where we have this idea of not being able to rub the strangeness from my sight. And so at this point, it's kind of maybe a little bit confusing knowing what's going on, um, but it seems likely that the speaker, you know, is looking at his water trough on his farm, since it seems like we're in a rural potential area here. And he takes a pane of glass from the drinking trough. We can kind of assume that from the idea of winter sleep, um, hoary grass might refer to um, frost-covered grass, since hoary means white or grayish. So that the, you know the, how the grass gets very white when it has the uh, frozen dew on it from the frost. So that perhaps this pane of glass that a speaker is referring to is a sheet of ice. I know uh, he kind of holds his eye up to his eye and kind of then sees the world through this winter view. And so because in this first image we get the idea that he's harvesting apples, now we get this idea of kind of winter coming along and being the, you know, the essence of winter is on the night, that kind of cool, crisp feeling in the night air, that perhaps here we're seeing a changing of the seasons because it's harvest time, which usually happens in the fall as we're moving into winter, and we're getting these hints that winter is kind of coming. And then, you know, we hear again how the speaker is tired, and he kind of describes either the dream he's having, or it could be he's sort of predicting what he will dream about. When we return to the end of the poem, it seems like that second option, uh, he's kind of describing what he thinks he will dream about, is more apparent, because he still seems like he's awake at the end of the poem. So in his dreams, he's seeing, you know, kind of this nightmare landscape of this endless stream of apples that are appearing and disappearing. Um, even in his dream, he can feel the pain in his feet from climbing the ladder, and, you know, can feel the ladder underneath him. And he hears then in this dream the sound of all these apples rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling in. As if, you know, it's kind of this uncountable, this unmanageable number of apples that he has to deal with. We kind of get that in a way that the poem rushes us through that when we read it. And I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. So there's no pause there, so we kind of feel that urgency, that rolling in of the apples, um, that he sort of is feeling his dream slash nightmare that he has going on here. So even in his sleep, he can't escape from this kind of hard work that he's done all day. And then here, you know, this line here would be something I might kind of highlight if I were going through the poem, because to me this seems sort of like a key line. You know, for I've had too much of apple picking, I'm overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. So again, that kind of this um, apple picking has not met his expectations, so it, it hasn't been a great harvest, but it's been a kind of, you know, a hard-won, exhausting great harvest. And sort of, you know, is reminiscent of earlier in the poem when he says, but I am done with apple picking now. We kind of get a repetition of ideas sort of linking the poem and the lines together. And then we kind of get this new image here of the apples that he cannot um, pick successfully, the ones that fall to the ground, uh, you know, the ones that may just fall off the branches before he can get to them, the ones he drops potentially. And when those apples hit the earth, they kind of then somehow become not worthy. You know, for all, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. 
So again, the idea of, you know, wasted kind of harvest, wasted potential there, um, that, you know, even though there's nothing wrong with those apples that hit the earth, when they kind of fall, they're no longer worthy, and they must kind of be thrown away into the cider apple heap to be made into apple cider, you know. And at the end, then we sort of come back to the speaker reflecting on his exhaustion, kind of returning to him maybe sitting in a chair in his house. And we get here another kind of hint this poem was dealing with the changing of the seasons. Um, you know, he refers to the woodchuck and kind of talking to the woodchuck about sleep. So we can sort of, you know, were he not gone? So we probably, it doesn't really seem like the woodchuck's necessarily dead, but perhaps the woodchuck is hibernating then. That's what that's referring to. And then it sounds like, you know, we get this last sort of line of the poem. The woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe it's coming on, or just some human sleep. So we see then, you know, the author kind of, the speaker seems to feel that his sleep is going to be similar to hibernation. But he kind of, you know, need to refer to the woodchuck to know if that's the case. Or it could just be kind of a regular human sleep. where We don't, you know, sleep for months. We just sleep for, you know, a period of eight hours or so, you know, over the night. But that we kind of get the sense this speaker really feels like he deserves a hibernation. So by referring to hibernation, and especially the woodchuck's hibernation, the speaker and, to degree, Frost really give us the sense that apple picking, harvesting, farming in general are truly exhausting jobs that really take a lot out of a person. So kind of this poem acts as both a look kind of into what farming entails, into the difficulty and the effort and the hard work that goes into farming in the rural lifestyle. So it kind of captures that emotion, captures that image, captures that feeling of exhaustion after a long day's work that you know, even those of us who are not farmers can relate to. But it also then kind of captures something that was really a major part of American history, the idea of you know, agriculture, working the land, you know, um, harvesting your own food, that kind of self-reliance, that independence, that relationship with the earth that we kind of think of when we think of more historic America. And so Frost is really kind of capturing that rural mindset and that rural sense of America here. Before closing this week's video, I'd like to remind you all of one important thing, and that is to trust in your own voices and responses to these poems. I know they're challenging, and it can be really tempting to go on the internet and use other people's ideas and interpretations as your own in your responses and your work for this class. But I'm not interested in hearing what those other people have to say. I want to know how you react to the poem, what you got out of the poem, and what sense you made out of it. So feel free to use those internet resources as tools to help you understand these poems. They should not replace your own ideas and your own thoughts and your own interpretations of these poems. So don't be discouraged and do your best to kind of work through these poems and analyze them as thoughtfully as you possibly can. And we'll work on developing those skills throughout the semester. See you next week.